business. It's the foundation of our livelihoods and its existence has revolutionized the way humans live. Through the production and distribution of products and services, businesses have created economic growth and opportunity, accelerated innovation, and raised the living standards of billions of people. It has allowed many people to live longer and with a better quality of life. But business has also been a main contributor to the major problems facing our world today. From climate change, ecosystem destruction, biodiversity loss, pollution, resource depletion, and social inequality, businesses and the way they are run have put humanity on a catastrophic path. But what needs to be done to change this? Is it really possible to make businesses both profitable and harmonious with our world? This is a series where we learn about the climate crisis, dig into the science behind it, and learn ways each of us can accelerate action, specifically through our jobs. I'm Erin with The Hive Initiative, and this is Climate Workspace. When I first started researching this topic, I naively thought it would be a quick series of tips on better business models. But the more I looked into it, the more I started to realize that in order to understand what we need to change, we first need to understand what business is, where it came from, and why it became such a driving force in our societies. The first economies came into existence 11,000 years ago with the agricultural revolution, when the inventions of farming and animal domestication allowed groups to transition away from being nomadic to staying in the same place, first happening in the Fertile Crescent or the modern day area around Iraq. This settling allowed for the first cities to form in the Mesopotamia region. There, innovations like the wheel and irrigation allowed for fewer people to be necessary for food production, which freed others to provide goods and services to each other. This freedom allowed for the creation of innovations such as writing, mathematics, and astronomy, each of which played a facilitating role in the development of long-distance trade. The concept of money was also developed in Mesopotamia, which allowed for individuals to pay for things they wanted or needed without also needing to have a desired item, as it was with bartering. And with money came the need for loans and credit, which drove the formation of the first banks. The concept of profit also arose as leaders of regions and people engaged in trade accumulated material wealth, which they could then use to their own benefit. And this was the birth of business, or an activity or enterprise entered into to make money and profit. The first businesses were sole proprietorships, where one person received all the profits and held all the liability, and partnerships where multiple people shared the financial gains and legal responsibilities. Eventually, over many years, the need arose to make a business its own entity, to take the liabilities off of its owners and allow for changes in ownership. And thus, the first corporations were created during the Roman Empire in the first century BCE. The word corporation is derived from the Latin word corpus, meaning a body of people. Running a business made people money, and having money made people powerful. The economies created made states and empires powerful, and thus the two concepts became politically intertwined. The first modern joint stock company was the United East India Company, formed in 1602 by the government of the Netherlands, which allowed residents of the Dutch Republic to buy and sell ownership shares, making them the first modern shareholders. The company funded expeditions to East Asia for the highly profitable spice trade. It was considered one of the first multinational corporations, or an organization that produces goods and services outside of its home country. These corporations were a driving force of colonialism, as they set up facilities and took over land in port cities abroad, in places with raw materials and resources. Many business practices, such as publicly traded companies, dividend payments to shareholders, Stock exchanges and global trade, which began in this era, remain today. 
the Industrial Revolution of the mid-18th century saw societies changing from being economically based on agriculture or agrarian to being based on manufacturing or industrial. This shift started in Great Britain and meant that workers moved from rural jobs to factory jobs. It ushered in innovations such as the steam engine, combustion engine, the harnessing of electricity, the assembly line, and the concept of mass production. All of these caused economic growth and wealth creation, which improved living standards of people, allowing them to buy more and take more of a part in economies. With more people participating in economies, more tax revenue was collected on earnings, which generated wealth for governments, who could then invest in improvements in science, transportation, healthcare, and education. These improvements lifted even more people out of poverty and made them able to work, spend money, and be taxed, creating a persistent cycle of economic growth for countries. Then, the Great Depression and the World Wars of the 1900s rocked the world's economies. Governments moved to measure, track, and lift their economic standing, and they did this through the calculation of GDP, or gross domestic product. GDP computes the monetary value of all goods and services produced within a country within a particular time frame. Over the rest of the century and continuing today, GDP is the key parameter world governments use to determine their power and drive their policy decisions and goals. It is seen that increasing GDP increases economic might, and economic might is seen as the ultimate mark of global power and societal health. In fact, GDP is the defining metric for whether or not a country is considered developed or developing, and is the basis for forums like the G7 and the G20. The modern world and who we are and how we live have been shaped by business. It's all we know, and it's hard to imagine what life might be like without its structure. And while it has allowed for great innovation, it has come at a tremendous cost to both our global society and especially our natural world. We are currently facing several major interconnected crises caused by businesses and industries that will dramatically impact our future. The first is rapid climate change. In order to create the products and services we rely on, businesses use our Earth's natural resources and then process them using energy. Some of these resources emit greenhouse gases themselves, such as livestock, Others release it during their production processes, such as rice and cement. Land use change, or converting natural forests into agricultural, industrial, or residential spaces, also releases greenhouse gas into our atmosphere, as the transition releases the carbon stored in the soil, eliminates the carbon storage capacity from the existing plants, and then introduces new emissions from how the land is then used. Land use change contributes a net 1.6 gigatons of CO2 release per year to the atmosphere. And then the processes which create the products and services require energy. Globally, 84% of energy produced is through the burning of fossil fuels. The increased release of greenhouse gases in the past 75 years have built up in our atmosphere and accelerated global climate change. We are currently seeing the effects of around 1.2 degrees of change with severe weather events, droughts, floods, and fires, which will increase in intensity and frequency in the coming years, making further change very hard to be stopped. The second crisis attributable to business activity is ecological breakdown. We are currently experiencing an accelerating rate of biodiversity loss. According to the report released by the World Wildlife Fund in 2022, populations across all monitored wildlife have on average declined by 69% since 1970. This loss in nature can be seen spread across the globe. The following map from the report shows the Biodiversity Intactness Index, 
with black areas representing an undisturbed, stable, natural environment, red areas showing loss, and yellow areas showing ecosystems at risk of collapse. So why does protecting biodiversity matter? It is our natural world which provides us with the healthy soil, clean air, water, and stable climate which we all depend on to live. Animals and plants are interconnected in a web of life. Changes in a single species can create a ripple effect that threatens the stability of our natural ecosystems, ultimately putting our basic needs in jeopardy. Businesses are contributing in five ways to biodiversity loss and ecological breakdown. The first is with changes to land or sea use, which was also mentioned before as a contributor to climate change. When businesses convert grassland into residential or industrial spaces, mine the land and seabed for metals, and convert forests into fields or pasture, they disrupt, displace, and destroy functioning ecosystems. This map shows the areas of the earth that have had land use change. In total, nearly one third of our global land has been changed since 1960. And as for the sea, our communication cables, offshore oil and gas platforms and pipes, aquaculture farms, seabed mining activities and bottom trawling fishing, and commercial ports now equal 32,000 square kilometers of habitat destruction from sea use change. The second way businesses cause ecosystem collapse is with over-exploitation through fishing, hunting, and poaching animals. Today, one-third of global fish stocks are overfished due to industrial fishing, and we are seeing dramatic declines in large predatory fish like swordfish, cod, and tuna. Other animals are trapped and sold for the under-regulated wildlife trade. A recent study shows that over 35% of reptile species are traded online with three quarters not covered by international trade regulation. 90% of them are captured from the wild. An example is the endangered western chameleon gecko of New Caledonia, which is legally protected but illegal collection continues due to their popularity as pets. Millions of birds are sold at international markets, and 30% of threatened birds are taken for food and for the pet industry. An example is the great green macaw, which is critically endangered, but remains profitable for the cage bird trade. Endangered mammals like primates and rhinoceros are hunted and then used in zoos, the pet industry, in biomedical research and in medicine. Or, like the world's rarest marine mammal, the vaquita, are not hunted themselves but get caught and killed in commercial fishing nets. The third way businesses contribute to ecological breakdown is with pollution. Contaminants are released to the air, water, and soil from a variety of industrial processes, which then increase in concentration as a plant or animal is exposed to the pollutant and then consumed by another animal along the food chain. Oil spills, organic waste, particulate matter, and toxic gases are all created through the production of our products. Plastic pollution is an exploding problem, with each year 14 million tons of it finding its way to the ocean, one ton released to the air, and hundreds of thousands of tons dumped into soils, then going into the bodies of animals and passing through the food chain. The sources of plastic pollution vary from the macroplastics from our packaging and fishing nets to the microplastics shed from the use of tires and cosmetics and the microfibers released through washing the garments of the textile industry. Noise is also a pollution that disrupts breeding cycles and interferes with an animal's ability to communicate, feed, and mate. Examples include birdsong being drowned out by factory noises, and cetacean echolocation being disturbed by the underwater noises from the activities of the shipping and oil and gas industries. Artificial light pollution also disrupts animal behaviors during the night, an example being insects drawn to street lamps. In Germany, a single street light was recorded to kill 6.8 million insects in the summer. 
This unintended consequence is especially problematic as 40% of insect populations are in decline. And some pollutants are used to kill on purpose, such as the chemical pesticides used in the farming industry, which kill not only the intended pests, but also beneficial pollinators and other animals along the food chain. The fourth way businesses are causing biodiversity loss is by introducing invasive species, which are often the result of our global trade and tourism. Non-native insects, shellfish, and plants get unintentionally spread to areas where they have few predators and can outcompete native plants and animals for resources. According to the United Nations Decade on Biodiversity, Invasive species have contributed to nearly 40% of all known animal extinctions since the 17th century. The fifth way businesses are contributing to biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse is through climate change. As our planet warms, it destroys habitats through increased fires, extreme weather, and changes in rainfall. It increases the spread of diseases and invasive species as animals and plants move out of their territories and into new ones. And beyond the damage to our natural world, businesses have caused damage to societies. They have exacerbated inequality with a very small group of people taking most of the benefits. From exorbitant payouts to CEOs, poor employee working conditions, unfair wages, and unreasonable working hours, to employing child labor in supply chains, to compromising the economies of countries abroad, to exploiting the privacy of their users, businesses have made people more divided, less trusting, and less willing to adapt in this crucial time. And while climate change, biodiversity loss, and societal harm are three of the most pressing problems affecting the welfare of our world, it must be noted that business activities have been incentivized by our governments. As was mentioned before, the metric of gross domestic product, or GDP, became widely used as a measure of economic health and well-being after World War II, with governments basing their regulations and decisions on it. It is calculated by simple formulas that add up all of the economic activity of a country. Economists use it to determine if an economy is growing or having a recession. It is being used to drive policy to this day with the accepted thought that growth in GDP means businesses are flourishing and more people are employed and contributing to an economy, which in theory means a healthy society. However, these simple formulas do not take into account income distribution, societal gains from unpaid work, and the environmental and social harm caused by profitable activities. According to GDP, one millionaire and nine people making $1,000 per year equals 10 people making $100,000 per year. According to GDP, volunteering and nature have no value. According to GDP, business activities which pollute the environment are more important than nonprofit activities which protect it. And thus, we see governments deregulate industries to improve company profits, allow companies to form industries around basic needs like housing, healthcare, and education, and allow activities which cause climate change and ecosystem collapse, all because they make money. And thus, more and more scientists and economists are calling for governments to end their focus on GDP. But what can be done to correct these fundamental imbalances? Can we simply rework our existing systems to better include nature and people? And if we don't use monetary growth to drive our policy decisions, then what would we use to measure, track, and align our societies? theories for how we might allow businesses to sustain us while at the same time support and protect nature, ranging from the concept of green growth, where resource use is included and accounted for in economic development, to post-growth, where we fundamentally reimagine how we structure our system. In green growth, economic growth remains a goal, but business activities shift to becoming environmentally sustainable. It aims to break or decouple the correlation between an increase in GDP and an increase in environmental impact. 
This graph illustrates how an increase in GDP worldwide has also meant an increase in CO2 emissions. The idea is that businesses and governments can work together to keep economies stable and growing by decarbonizing existing production processes, implementing renewable low emission energy sources like wind, solar, and nuclear, and reducing waste through circular system design and advances in technology. It is estimated that this green shift would also have social benefits, as it could create 24 million new jobs globally by 2030. The idea of placing a monetary value on nature, animals, and ecosystems also ties into the green growth strategy, with the concept being that giving nature a price will fund its protection and prevent its abuse. An example of this is the Nature Risk Profile, a methodology recently launched by the UN Environment Program and S&P Global, which allows the financial sector to monitor and take action on companies who impact biodiversity. Green growth has had traction. It has been discussed and included in the policies of China, the EU, Japan, the US, UK, and South Korea. International organizations, including the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the International Energy Agency, and several United Nations agencies have all created policy strategies around green growth. Supporters of green growth argue that it is a pragmatic solution because it works alongside ways governments are already running and does not require deep systemic or social change. However, green growth faces challenges. By working alongside GDP, it does not address the root problems of overconsumption and social and wealth inequality. It allows markets to continue to encourage productivity and resource use. So while green growth is a step in a better direction, it might not produce the results we need to counter the accelerating effects of climate change and ecosystem collapse. To rescue the global environment and humanity's future, we must transform the accounting systems that reward pollution and waste. We must place true value on the environment and go beyond gross domestic product as a measure of human progress and well-being. Post-growth and degrowth are movements which seek to remove economic growth as a goal of our economic systems, reduce global material production and consumption, and replace GDP as an indicator of progress with other measurements that reflect policies of social and environmental progress, known as the well-being economy, as promoted by initiatives like Earth for All and the Well-Being Economy Alliance. The idea would be to slow down production, to remove incentives for harmful industries, and increase social services, including universal access to housing, education, transportation, and food. It would also decrease working hours and allow for people to have more time to themselves to learn new things, give care to others, and engage in democracy. With needs taken care of and more time to enjoy life, there would be an easier adaptation to reducing consumption. Societies would be transformed to allow their citizens to share and maintain resources, bringing them closer, which would in turn allow larger areas to be reclaimed by nature. And this would be for all people worldwide, so people in impoverished countries would have their living standards lifted to match those in rebalanced affluent countries. In addition to slowing production, a large effort would be made to innovate needed products and services to eliminate their emissions, pollution, and waste to make them circular and powered by clean energy. But is this really possible? How would we actually transition our current societies focused on growth, consumption, and increasing personal wealth to ones actively redistributing it? Government action is key, and ecological economists have modeled paths to do this. These paths include removing fossil fuel subsidies and increasing taxes on industries which are highly emitting, polluting, and damaging. They include taking a greater role in social safety by making sure all citizens have access to their basic necessities. And they include taxing affluence. It may be difficult to convince those that hold the world's wealth many of which believe they deserve to have it, that they must now embrace sharing it. 
Billionaires and millionaires make up just 1.1% of the world's population, but hold 45.8% of the total wealth. Rebalancing the wealth of this small group has the power to pay for our transition away from GDP and towards the well being economy, and towards a future where we all have what we need in harmony with nature. So, as we work on the large task of reforming the mechanisms running our societies, we can't wait for regulation to guide the actions of the places we work. Each of us must work now to adapt and transform our products, our services, and our roles to lessen its impact. It brings us back to our original question, how do we make business sustainable? The answer to this question is that all businesses need to actively monitor, account for, and correct the environmental and social impact of their activities in addition to the pursuit of profit. We need to ensure this for all activities, both in operations and in production, for ourselves as well as for our suppliers. We need to actively make certain that none of us, including shareholders and leadership, are taking exorbitant profits. We need to make all working environments safe for every person active in the creation of our products. We need to ensure that our activities are supporting and encouraging healthy communities, both in our home countries, the countries where our products are produced, and where our products are consumed. We need to make sure that our business, in our offices and throughout our supply chains, releases no pollution to the environment. Our business must actively work to preserve and protect wild areas and allow for the rebuilding of habitats and nature. And we must act to prevent any greenhouse gas emissions through either our or our suppliers' production processes. And finally, we need to cut the waste that both accumulates in our natural world and eats into our profits. By actively rethinking our products and business models to include repair and reuse, and by eliminating short lived or unnecessary packaging, we keep Earth's limited resources in use, out of landfills, and prevent the need for their further extraction from our environment. We can think of this list as a checklist and run our existing products and services as well as our future concepts through them. If we find a breach, we must work to either fix it or phase it out. Only then, when all categories are met, will we be able to call ourselves a sustainable business. The task is big, but we can totally do this. The more we support our governments in moving away from GDP and towards well-being, and the more we transform each of our roles and products and services to be kinder to the planet, the sooner we get to have the fair, happy, global society that can last far into the future. Thanks for watching. I hope that this video has inspired you to take action today to make your work better for our planet. If you need a bit of help, the Hive Initiative does offer a workshop that brings employees together to work on climate solutions called the Mini Climate Summit. It can be a great way to get more hands working on the problem and can also be a great way to transform the climate anxiety that so many employees feel into something a bit more productive. A link to more information is in the description.